John, I can mark the years now by our, by our sit-downs, which I always appreciate. I've always enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad. Um, you know, I guess one place to just start, given how many different things we'll discuss here in our time together, is just what you've been kind of thinking about lately. Um, I mean, the world hasn't changed that dramatically from the last time we spoke, but it does seem to accelerate in terms of the change itself. Well, there, well there's no question that, that, especially in our industries, right, TMT, uh, two major dynamics, scale and, and globalization, have, have become very important. And uh, certain areas where some of the largest companies uh, in, the, in the world, in, in uh, communications, are colliding or competing and changing the dynamic. So in particular, you know, the acceleration of Netflix over the last few years has really changed the, the entire area of content, entertainment content creation and distribution. Uh, and it's, it's affecting everybody in the space who, who is either directly or indirectly tied into that. So that's one big change. And then obviously the explosion of uh, Google and, and uh, Facebook in terms of targeted advertising and the ability to use knowledge of the consumer and the consumer's behavior in order to uh, extract uh, higher valuation from advertising is also shifting that part of, of the industry. Right. Uh, and then there's the constant technology technological change that creates competition in terms of even the connectivity businesses with 5G now uh, on the horizon and, uh, and high speed uh, connectivity uh, becoming pretty universal uh, and massive databases and the ability to use AI to predict behavior or extract uh, information from massive databases. These are all interesting, accelerating changes. Um, let's start with a few of them. Let's start with the Netflix one. We've sat, I've sat with you for years. I mean, I can remember actually when you were trying to call the cable industry to attention and say, hey, let's do something here before this thing explodes. Yes. Yeah. It's too late now. Well, they, they've got a massive lead and, uh, in that space. It's difficult to imagine that anybody can displace them. The question is, uh, are there opportunities to have second, third, fourth, fifth? Which is what I wanted to ask. So we're a year out from Disney rolling out. The Fox deal should close in the not too distant future, yes. but a year out from them rolling out their entertainment direct to consumer offering. They've already got one in the market that's starting with sports. Mm -hmm. um, they're also gonna be the majority owner of Hulu. Do you think Disney can do it? Do you think that they can uh, mount a sufficient competitive uh, product for Well, they, they have great brand, there's no question, and, and they really know the entertainment business. What, what they don't have is a massive number of global credit cards. In other words, they don't have massive direct consumer relationships at this point, uh, and uh, those are not easy to come by. Uh, you know, if you look at the other people in the space, Amazon, because of their retailing businesses uh, and the creation of Prime, uh, has been able to tie into consumer interest pretty globally. Uh, and, and so it's very easy for Amazon to sell an incremental service. You know, while you're buying this or looking at that, how about this or how about that? It's traditional retailing, but in this case, it's service retailing. And as you know, Amazon is currently offering a long list of supplemental uh, uh, premium services uh, like Showtime Stars and so on. Um, so you have that going on. You have Apple wanting to be in this space. Apple is the big gorilla. When you say wanting to be in this space, what do you mean? Wanting to develop a direct consumer entertainment relationship beyond music, let's call it into video. And I, I 
we were estimating that Apple has probably 650 to 700 million direct consumer relationships in which Apple has a credit card, uh, a lot of information about the consumer. So uh, relatively easy for them to offer an incremental service, whether it's free and ad supported or whether it's, it's going to be a subscription like add-on to what they already do. They haven't really done it yet though. I mean, no, they've dabbled boy, in they've it. they've been they've, circling. You know, they, yeah. They've been circling and they've started to put money into original content. Uh, and they're certainly having lots of discussions in and around the content industry uh, to figure this out. And, you know, they want to drive their consumer interface technology, their ecosystem into the video space in the living room more heavily than Apple TV has so far. I mean, Apple TV so far has been a, a, a technology, but it doesn't come with an Apple supplied set of content. So I think that that's what they would like to do. And, and Jeff is on a roll with his Fire Stick and his Prime and his content. And so he's in the living room and Alexa is a, is a voice activated uh, interface that, that works well, is well thought through, well engineered, interfaces with Netflix. I mean, well engineered, okay? So the technology side, if, if Disney has a problem, okay, I believe it's going to be those two things. It's going to be the technology platform and it's going to be establishing those one-to-one -one consumer relationships. Even beyond the attendance at the park? I mean, they would tell you, hey, we have millions of people who come, many millions every sure. year all over the world who are obviously interested in our product and we have their credit card numbers. No, I understand. And so they'll reach out to those people and they'll, they'll do marketing to those people and so on. They have a strong brand and it will have most appeal, I think, in a segment of the population. Disney has the other problem, which is, you know, most of their content is tied up for several years. Uh, I, I suspect Netflix still has the tail end of a lot of the Disney output as does Stars, believe it or not, still has a number of uh, digital global rights related to Disney content. So it's going to take Disney a while to clear their content. Um, so, you know, in terms of who has the best brand to go to the consumer for entertainment, uh, Disney's it. How successful their platform will be. You know, they bought BAM. Yep. in order to accelerate their technology. How successful that will be. There are many, many people out there trying to develop direct consumer uh, businesses in content. And, uh, Where are we going to end up, John? Are we, is everybody going to keep their own content and nobody's going to share and everybody's going to try to create their <laughs> well, own direct to consumer? Well, my, my speech to my traditional <laughs> brethren in the, in the historic cable industry is you just got to morph from being a bundled retailer in linear video services to a bundled provider of, of inter interactive, over the top, whatever you want to call them, services. And you should think of yourself as a broader retailer of everything that you transport on your, on your uh, high speed network. So, you know, Many operators are currently distributing Netflix, for instance. Uh, most are in deep discussions with Amazon about, about carrying the Amazon stuff. Adding it to the bill, uh, marketing it, promoting it, providing security. Uh, and as we see the Internet of Things come in, there are many devices and services that ride over that terrestrial network that the cable brethren should think about being a retailer of. And there are services associated therewith. For instance, do you know what's connected to your Wi-Fi in right. your home? Um, and do you know what should be connected? And do you know what shouldn't be connected? I mean, 
there are security issues. There mm -hmm. are. So uh, it seems to me that, that the need as these services proliferate to be able to consolidate them into a set of offerings that are, pardon the expression, bundled uh, and secured and priced. Uh, and that security really cuts two ways. The content owner needs assurance that their content's not getting ripped off. Right. And that's hard where you're talking about from a server somewhere on the globe, direct to a consumer, how does the content owner know that he's actually getting paid for his product? So, so providing uh, those kinds of bundled services seems to me to be uh, something that, that my traditional industry should be very focused on right now and morphing from just being a retailer of linear traditional channels to being a much more broad uh, offering of, of products and services of third parties. Right, um, and I want to talk a bit more about that. I, to finish up on Disney though, a lot of investors, as you might imagine, are trying to figure out what it's going to cost them, you know, incrementally beyond obviously what they already spend to produce. Mm -hmm. You have any idea? Um, I mean, you mentioned buying out, the, potentially trying to buy out some of the rights or buy back the rights to your content, yeah. create more than you typically would to populate this service. Um, well, if it's in scripted content, the amount of money being spent trying to create unique scripted content is just exploding. Uh, and so if you go at it that way, this could, I mean, it's unlimited how much I you mean, can spend. I mean, Netflix is spending, well, eight billion on balance sheet, but even 12 billion or some a oh, yeah. number that's. Oh, they're all throwing Hail Mary passes in content. They're disrupting the traditional studio architecture, uh, going directly to talent, bidding against each other for anything that looks unique. I mean, this is going to be a food fight for a while. And, you know, if Disney gets in the middle of the food fight, they have some big advantages because they own a lot of the intellectual property and the characters and so on. So if they largely develop against their existing intellectual property, I think they'll just be fine. I don't think that they, they get too carried away or too, you know, too crazy in terms of this arms race. You know, if they want to go broader and uh, then I think they can spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think, I think they're smart guys and I don't think they'll do that. I think they will play to their strength, which is their brand. They have a wonderful global brand and they're just going to have to live up to their brand in terms of what they deliver. And they, they've got to figure out how to make it somewhat unique because, you know, their content's been out there forever. So people are used to getting it and not paying for it. Right, or not understanding that they're paying right, for it. Right, right. So to make that transition, and the question is, how much pain are they willing to suffer pulling back rights from existing distribution so that they create this appetite or starvation even for their brand and their, and their content so that when they then offer it as a premium direct consumer service, people are willing to say, real value, I right? should pay for it now, and I didn't used to have to pay for it, what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that transition, which... Uh, it's going to take a know, while. I mean, not that while. they don't expect it's going to take a while, I think they do, but it will take a while to get traction, won't it? I would say if there's anybody with the best chance to be number three, it's them. Mm -hmm. I think HBO has been a wonderful, great, enterprise for many years. It's primarily been always domestic focused. I don't believe HBO has retained many rights outside the U.S. Most of their international distribution is in partnerships or complex arrangements. So I, I think getting outside the U.S. and being able to compete in the arms race when you've got a two and a half, two point six billion dollar content budget against guys who are already global, growing rapidly, and have four or five times that in mind, uh, I think they're going to they're be challenged, okay? 
is there any is there any chance that Netflix hits a wall at some point? I mean, clearly, as long as their subscriber count continues to rise dramatically, it would seem they have on the unlimited ability to to take what they need. But they're yeah, not I mean, generating. They, they're not necessarily generating the kind of returns and or EBITDA or free cash flow no. that you'd like to see in a business. So far, it's an equity play that is based upon growth, valuation of growth, right. and the general belief that there'll be a point at which they can take their foot a little bit off the throttle, right? They, they demo, their stock really took off, David, when they could demonstrate pricing power. Mm -hmm. So when they raised their prices and didn't lose any material subscribers, I think the financial market said, aha, glue, right? So if you have glue and you have growth and pricing power, right? Now the question is how to manage that. So. Unless, unless Reed, you know, uh, which he won't, does something really nuts, I think it's a question of modulating their, their spend and coasting in to maturity, at which point they should be enormously cash generative. Okay? And the only thing I can see that interrupts that is some number two comes in and starts a price war. But I don't see why number two would start a price war, right? Yeah. I think Netflix right now provides a pricing umbrella. And as long as the competitors come at it either under that price umbrella or like Amazon is doing, where it's a whole different bundle, right? I think. There's clearly room for two or three global providers in this space coming at it from slightly different perspectives. So, you know, I think Netflix will, will be very successful, in my opinion. Um, when and I think Amazon, obviously, is going to be very successful. And the question is, who's going to be number three? Well, I think you've answered it to a certain extent. And you I, expect it to be Disney. I expect it to be Disney. Yeah. Where does that leave AT&T Time Warner? which you've called, I believe, apples and oranges. Well, yeah, AT&T Time Warner, you know, is fundamentally a domestic business. Uh, certainly in, in uh, you know, AT&T is, is uh, when they bought DirecTV, right, it became a satellite business uh, in the U.S. and in Latin America, and they've been trying to divest, I believe, of their Latin American component so they can focus more on the U.S. So, you know, as, as a unique set of content that can create glue for their wireless and potentially terrestrial businesses, uh, the content, you know, is attractive. It differentiates. And because there's such a big distributor in the U.S., the rest of the distributors in the U.S. pretty much have to carry everything and offer everything that, that AT&T Time Warner supplies. So I think, I think they have a very strong position in the U.S. in distribution slash content, very similar to what Comcast has. Right. Okay? Right. So that's not a terrible model if the bulkier business is U.S. focused. The real question for them is, how successful can they be internationally? And how much juice do they want to put behind? Well, you've already said HBO probably is not going to be able to compete the way it has previously, given what it's spending on content. They could. I don't know if AT&T is willing to write those massive checks to play you know, against the incumbents, you know, Amazon, Netflix, and to compete with Disney on the margin for, for that third seat. Right. That, that, I think, if I was Randall, I'd be scratching my head and saying, when I bought it, bought it HBO was the scent gland. It was the crown jewel. It's what I wanted. Uh, now it's subscale. And how much do I have to spend? They've had great creative at HBO. The question now is, how much do I have to spend, and how much, uh, how much income do I have to forego 
right, for the next couple of years to build up. But do they have the capacity to even do that, John? I mean, DirecTV is losing 340,000 subs every quarter at this point. DirecTV now is not a business that is profitable. Lowell McAdam told me he believed that when they bought DirecTV, they made a big strategic error. Right, Lowell McAdam, the former CEO of Verizon. The former CEO of Verizon. And so I'm sure he's smiling at this point and watching them struggle because he could have bought you know, Charlie, Echo Star, and he, in order to get both Spectrum and the satellite business and get a surge in terms of video scale. And he did not do it. He wasn't interested in going that route. Uh, and so this is going to be very interesting to watch it is. Well, right uh, now, Verizon has got a 240 something billion dollar market cap without having done a deal in AT&T, so two, about 220, having just spent, I don't know, what was it, 80 billion on, AT on Time Warner. No, there's no question that the market is skeptical right now as to whether or not AT&T, by essentially diversifying, okay, uh, made the right strategic move. Now, at the end of the day, it's a, it's, it's a great company, and I'm sure they'll figure it out, but my guess is they end up being much more domestic focused and really don't try and go. Now, that doesn't mean HBO can't see its content distributed globally. Right. The question is by who? And they don't necessarily have to be the, the, the direct consumer distributor of, of the quality content that they produce. And so a hybrid model where you're producing for your own distribution domestically, where, where you have a very strong position and a very good monetization model today. And uh, you can also use it to differentiate your, your connectivity services, uh, while at the same time creating content that's going to be in great demand by the direct consumer guys outside the U.S. I mean, that model could well be uh, a survival model, even a, a incremental profitable model for them. And, and I think, if I had to guess, they're, they're chewing on that right now. They are. But I mean, not to bring up bad memories for you when I say the name and I talk about debt, but they've got an awful lot of debt at AT&T right now. Yes, but they've got a lot of free cash flow. They do. They do. Uh, you know, the, it is a capital intensive business they're in. And so their, their, I think, free cash flow flexibility, given the big dividend, uh, given the capex required by the wireless business, and potentially a lot of capital to go into 5G, uh, you know, I don't know that they're going to be taking a lot of flyers, you know, big, massive increases in the HBO spend budget uh, in order to go global. I don't know if they'll come to that conclusion. They might. Uh, you know, it's a question of how much, how far out on a limb do you want to go when you've got a drag on your, you know, on your uh, core business. Yeah. Well, we've, you've mentioned global. We've a few times here. Let's talk about that because Comcast, my parent company, has gone global, so to speak, with the acquisition of Sky. Disney, with the other assets it's acquiring in the Fox deal, has gone certainly more global than they have right, been. Right. Uh, does that put the, the others who aren't at a disadvantage? Uh, it's all about scale. It's all about scale. And you know, you can go global, but if, if the dogs aren't eating the dog food, it doesn't matter. Right. right? But if, if, in fact, you find real scale, growth scale, to where you can amortize your investments across a global uh, footprint of increasingly active, even, even third world households are using these digital platforms in order to consume content. Uh, and so there is a global marketplace out there and it is enormous. And, uh, and so you're giving up 90% of your potential market if you're not thinking globally. Uh, now, some things don't translate. Some things do translate. Um, you think the Sky deal was a good deal? <laughs> Brian will shoot me if I, if I say no. He, he paid a lot of money for Sky. 
I think the proof is going to be how he goes. The bulk of the Sky business is UK, and the bulk of the UK business is a satellite to consumer business. Uh, he has to make the transition from satellite distribution to internet transmission over time. Right. right now he's on a British telecom DSL platform that where the third leg of the triple play is not that competitive. So it's going to be interesting to watch how he, uh, how he transitions that business to what degree he can use his Xfinity technology investment to further his UK distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and also what the synergies are on the content side between Sky's content owned and, and distributed and what Universal NBC can do to enhance you know, the quantity and quality of the proprietary content. I mean, that's going to be an interesting thing for Brian. He needed to get global. He needed to get beyond the shores in a meaningful way. And this was the most attractive asset out there uh, for him to do that. And, uh, you know, he paid a, a, a full price for it. Certainly did but he can afford it. I mean, uh, Comcast has developed a very powerful balance sheet uh, and it's been used here. I think his leverage is, this takes him to three and a half times. I think it's a little over that, isn't it? Yeah. But this not. is cash accretive to him. Right. Right? Right. I mean, when you think at the cost that he borrows money versus the cash flow multiple that he's paying, Yep. Uh, you know, this is still cash accretive, and uh, and it gets him a, a foothold in Europe. I mean, this isn't Normandy; this is the UK. Right. But still, this is Brian's invasion of Europe, and uh, and he need he needed to do this on the content side. There is some synergy on the technology side. But there should ultimately be a lot of synergy on the content side. And that's the way I look at it. Um, Liberty Global, mm -hmm. we don't talk that often about it, but yeah. given the subject now of Europe in yeah. particular, right. how do you see that property of yours evolving and or playing in this evolving marketplace? You have the deal with Vodafone, it hasn't been approved obviously in terms right. of the German properties, you'll be largely UK based. Yeah. But tell us, where do things stand in your mind? Well, in, in Europe, it became very clear that, that the consolidation of the wired and wireless networks was the future. Uh, for Liberty Global, uh, that was mandated really by the fact that the incumbents were, were both terrestrial and wireless. And they, they were waking up, starting to upgrade their terrestrial facilities and we would be at a severe disadvantage if we didn't also have a wireless off. So, so we were terrestrial going into wireless, they were wireless reinvesting in terrestrial. Uh, the way I look at it, that business pretty typically is a duopoly when it comes to terrestrial. Uh, so you have a stable duopoly on terrestrial connectivity in which we have the speed advantage. Uh, we're sort of the incumbent high speed and the, and the, uh, the telcos are uh, upgrading uh, with either VDSL or ultimately building some fiber. And so we're headed toward a duopoly, stable duopoly uh, on terrestrial uh, distribution. And wireless has always been plagued by too much competition, uh, you know, four typical competitors in a high fixed, low variable cost business, you know, as the airlines learned, is not the best business model. And on top of that, governments encouraging or forcing 
uh, access. Right. So you typically might have four network owners and, and you might have another two or three or four MVN or, or uh, resellers. That's not been a great, in recent years, not been a great uh, model for the wireless guys uh, as they have to continue to compete with each other aggressively and spend capital. So the wireless guys like Vodafone that were pure wireless decided there's got to be a better model. So they started uh, to uh, invest in terrestrial networks where they had wireless. So uh, KDG, which was the, the rest of Germany that we didn't own, uh, was Vodafone's first move, and it's worked out well for them. The synergies are very large. The, the churn in their customer relationships came down dramatically, and they say, aha, it's the aha moment. Right. This really is probably the future of our business is to combine these networks. Uh, so in the case of Liberty Global, where we could uh, go into wireless in a, in a uh, rational way uh, through MVNOs or ultimately the purchase of one of the four networks, uh, we did it. So in Belgium, for instance, we're fully integrated and we own it or control it. In Holland, we achieved that by doing a joint venture with Vodafone that's 50-50 and has put their wireless together with our terrestrial. And I think that's working out quite well. In Germany, there was really nothing, no network for us to buy. And our MVNO relationships were pretty unsatisfactory. So we came to the conclusion that, that we needed to do something. Uh, in order to benefit from the synergies. The, the business we have has been a wonderful business. It continues to grow very nicely, but we saw that there was no way for us to own a German wireless network. We, we were really only like 35% of German footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, Vodafone had the other two thirds. Uh, they weren't gonna sell it to us. Uh, and we couldn't justify uh, the enormous value we'd have to pay to buy a pan-German cellular business when we only had a third of the footprint. So the logical, and the markets concluded this three years ago, right. and we're pushing this together constantly, uh, we concluded that the best solution would be a merger uh, in, in those markets. Uh, UK is a different animal. Belgium's a different animal. Uh, we still have opportunities to consolidate networks with us as the acquirer. We, we've done that in Belgium. Uh, we still have the opportunity to buy Vodafone out of Holland or vice versa. Switzerland, there's an opportunity to combine with a wireless network. We do have a decent MVNO there. So really it comes down to Virgin in England, yeah. where uh, at least at the present time, uh, we have the lead in terms of quality of terrestrial network. We are committed to a build out, so, so we're expanding our footprint and we have an attractive MVNO relationship with British Telecom for wireless. So at the moment, we're very happy with our positioning in the UK and Ireland. And so that, that's sort of the story of the consolidation of wired and wireless. It's very synergistic. It really helps you if you have both. If, you, if you're subscale in a country, you cannot, the, the synergies just aren't yours. They're the other guys, right? right? So that's just reality. Are you, are you optimistic on the regulatory review? Yes, I, I, I would give it at least 80%. I mean, there'll be a little pain, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I think we knew, and Vodafone knew that going in, that there'd be a little pain right from a regulatory point of view. Uh, we had a little pain when we combined the two regions of Germany ourselves. Vodafone had a little pain so we've experienced this before, 
and uh, and we'll just we'll just have to play out. But I would say I'd give it at least an 80 percent probability of close. Um, if it does, then uh, Liberty Global will. And by the way, it's a very tax efficient uh, transaction. So Liberty Global, very little tax leakage, will have really an enormous amount of capital to redeploy uh, following it. And, uh, you know, they've been good at, at redeploying capital. So, you know, I think uh, I'm optimistic. But I would say that, you know, the stock, the stock is traded down a little now because of the regulatory uncertainty. But, you know, they're, they're certainly undervalued assuming the deal closes. Right. Um, Want to get back to, uh, to these shores mm -hmm. uh, in the time we have left. Um, you were talking a bit about, of course, the way that you view and you believe that uh, the, what we used to call the traditional linear video right. providers right. should be viewing their business. Let's talk about Charter a bit, sure. an important holding, obviously, right. Right. for Liberty overall. A year ago, you and I sat here and we were talking about um, SoftBank, how real 540 was, right. Verizon, yeah. um, seems to have passed. Do you... For now. For now? For now. I Do mean, you regret that, that it passed? Do you regret that there was an opportunity there that wasn't seized, given the stock is 328 right now? Look, uh, you know, you're always worth more dead than alive in the business world, right? In other words, on any given day, you can usually sell a company for more than its market trading value. So in the short run, uh, would, would that have been something to pursue? And, you know, if we own, instead of a 328 stock, you know, we had $350 worth of Verizon stock, would we be better off? Would the future be brighter? You know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think, Clearly, some of us uh, on the board and in the company thought we should have more aggressively pursued some of those interests. Uh, I can tell you that the deals that were on the table would not have gotten anybody's support. Okay? So Verizon would have had to get more aggressive uh, for that deal to have had any chance. And, you know, whether or not they could have, would have, had we engaged more deeply, I think is, is uncertain. You know, Moss's overture would require us to believe that Sprint could be fixed quickly. Uh, and, you know, our guys believe that it was going to take at least three years and at least 18 billion to build out their network and their towers. Uh, to be fully competitive with, uh, with the incumbents. And that would be a huge distraction for the management at Charter uh, while they're focused primarily on driving the integration of Time Warner Cable and, uh, and converting that network from analog to digital, which was Tom's primary yep. quote, value creator. So, you know, uh, those were really the two possible combinations. You know, Moss uh, was backed by potentially this sovereign wealth funds. Um, well, by the right, his vision yeah. fund to a certain extent. But he never. Uh, the problem with Moss's overture was it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't deemed to be equal for all shareholders, and as a result. Uh, you know, some of us felt, A, that it would be awkward to even propose it, and B, that, that uh, we doubted that it could get the support of the independent board members, uh, because it was essentially a, a, a proposal that some of us would have a guaranteed future valuation, and the others would be coming out primarily currently for cash. Uh, so, with no guarantee of the stock component. So, I think it's the formulation of the offer that, uh, that made it very awkward to pursue Amasa's uh, 
you know, he's a great guy and he's, as you know, very aggressive. But, uh, but I don't believe it was ever formulated in a way that, that could have gotten uh, support. Right. But you say, it's funny, when I ask about it, you say for now, in terms of whether or not it's off the table. Well, at do the you same think time, that a T-Mobile uh, well, I don't see who wanting to go into, you know, just look forward a few years. Yeah. Uh, if it turns out that 5G is an attractive, evolves to be demonstrated to be an attractive fixed solution, uh, Charter will have a maturing high-speed powered local network in the part of the world it serves uh, very incrementally positive to add a 5G onto that platform, right? So that isn't going away. The, the fundamental technological platform that Lowell envisioned in putting the companies together is still going to be there and it's in fact going to be more mature and more enhanced. So I always say that, that if there were real synergies in that combination, those potential synergies will continue. The, the way in which management of the companies look at this, right. right, is why a deal didn't take place a year ago. Well, right now, Hans right. Vestberg, who's running Verizon, he's focused, is very he, focused on 5G. He's focused on and 5G. And they've been rewarded in the marketplace for, for doing so over and time, last time when play, they went to 4G. Well, let me point out, yeah. Charter is trading at, what, 9.1 times? Comcast attributed to that business, maybe seven. Yep. Okay. Tom is being rewarded for a clear, pure play, mm -hmm. leveraged cash flow, growth buyback story. Right? right. Not experimenting over here or not trying to buy a content company or right. So Charter is currently, and the Charter shareholders are currently be rewarding the same way with with premium valuation and a big buyback program that gives liquidity to its shareholders, okay? Now that's not my traditional way of, of building a business, yeah. but it's Tom's and it's working. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it, this is, you know, the old one cookie, two cookie thing, right? So, you know, for, for, for your viewers, you know, four-year-old kids, given one cookie, told if they don't eat it for half an hour, they get a second cookie. Seven percent, seven percent of four-year-olds have the discipline to wait for the second cookie, right? You're not saying Rutledge is that's a four-year-old. Seven, that's seven <laughs> percent yeah. turn out to be substantially, demonstrably more successful in life than than the other 93%, right? So, so, you know, spending all your money supporting your stock and buying it back is, is eating that cookie, in my opinion. Understood, and you clearly believe that there may be another opportunity to revisit, if it makes sense, a sale of charter Correct. at some point. Correct. And Correct. perhaps Tom will be in a different place in terms of his view of value as well? Yes, and, and, and you know, Tom is a terrific operator, right? And so he's got a very clear vision. And, and keep in mind, now you had a small company acquiring a company that was three or four times as big. Right. Right? When Charter, with Tom, acquires Time Warner Cable and Newhouse, yep. has to integrate those and has to upgrade and convert the Time Warner network to Tom's vision of what a cable network should look like. That's a massive undertaking. And he's done a great job of it. And so you can understand his focus. And you can ask yourself, okay, at, at the point that that's accomplished and the cash flow growth accelerates and the capital intensive declines and the free cash flow blossoms, then what does Tom want to do at that point, right? Yep. So I, I, I really, in all honesty, think this is a stage, right, where Tom is basically saying, don't bother me with all this other stuff. I've got this focus and this vision and this challenge, and i got to get this done. 
And once I've got that done, then you guys, you naysayers, right, can say, now what should we do? But if, if I don't get this done, everybody's going to be disappointed, right? So people don't understand the hodgepodge of assets that Tom inherited and how much energy it takes to drive everything to a uniform national platform with one technology, all digital, all high definition, all high speed, you know, gigabit. It's, it's a massive undertaking. And, uh, and so, you know, I understand. That's what he wanted to get done first, and he's well on his way to getting it done. So I think for that board, in a year, two years, there's going to be this big question. Okay, now what? Okay. Right. Now we, we're generating, you know, this big, this big free cash flow. Are we going to have an opportunity to steal an NBC Universal from somebody like Brian did? Okay. <laughs> so, really? Yes, really. I mean, you don't know. Timing. Timing. If you have dry powder, you're, you're trying you to have... get Brian to split the company. Is that what I'm sort of hearing here too, John? Are you no, no. I'm just I'm envying one? Brian. I see. Okay. I think he made a fabulous transaction with NBC Universal, which gets us to GE, which we're not going to talk about now. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, but you know what? We're running out of time, so right. I do want to hit a couple of other sure, things sure. before we before we wrap up somehow where the time goes. Um, the RSNs are for sale. Right. You know, you know that business. You've talked about it being a tax on the we've consumer. We've been in it. We've been out of it. We've sold them. We bought you, them. We in, yeah. interest yeah. in in the in that in that group of uh, well, if if you're the Atlanta Braves, which is one of our assets, yep. and you have Sports South, and the Braves are probably the major programming component of Sports South, you automatically have an interest in whether or not you should try and own the distribution to the consumer of your content. Uh, so obviously, you know, we're watching it, we're looking at that. Uh, if you're charter, there may be an interest in some of the regions yeah. that are, that are. Although I've asked Rutledge, yeah. he's not seemed, I mean, on the, on the record in front of a camera, he's not seemed particularly interested. Well, I agree. It's all about uh, the nature of the rights, okay? Because essentially, you're, all of these businesses that are successful but are based upon sports contracts, sports right contracts that are relatively short duration, in a world where the next time they get renewed, the prices are going to be much higher because you now have new kinds of distributors who will pay premiums um, well more than they can earn from that business in order to share shift or to drive an agenda. So, you know, you have Amazon in the UK paying through, paying a huge price for Premier Leagues, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I look at any business that is based upon sports rights contracts uh, as being vulnerable. And I don't know that I would pay a big premium because I know when Sports South contract comes up, the Braves are going to get a much more aggressive deal than they have now. Right. So why would I buy something that is under that threat? Uh, and also, you know, the distributors are kind of up to here with, uh, and you may see, as happened in L.A., some distributors just decide it's just too expensive, only a subset of my customers are interested in it. I'm not going to pay for all my customers something that should be a premium service just to the ones who want it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to go through that argument again, which is to say that the best buyer is somebody who has other market power, right? So potentially Fox. So potentially Fox, uh, where they are now. Right. Where they've been grown and nurtured because nobody wants to live without the Fox Network, Fox News, and oh, by the way, you got to take regional sports or we won't, you know, it's a bundle. Yep. And so I think Lachlan is 
the best buyer. It'll be embarrassing for Disney to pay 15 and turn around and sell at eight, yep. right? But I think that's reality. Uh, um, John, finally, just quickly, we, I always like to end on you a little bit. Sure. There was much made when you stepped down from a couple of boards, from the right. charter board and others. Yeah. You look good to me, <laughs> and I've seen you through the years. Yeah. I, I, no, no, it's it's. Are you uh, slowing down? Are you thinking about your the future in a different way? Well, several things. First of all, my wife has a health condition that makes it much more difficult for me to travel for business. So, the travel obligations of being on boards that aren't where I am, you know, is a challenge for 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 us. Uh, you know, we're coming up on 60 years of marriage, so uh, she's very, very important to me, and that's, that's number one. Uh, and then I have ISS and those types of people saying I'm on way too many boards to begin with, and they're recommending don't vote for John. He's on 13 boards or something. And, uh, and so I'm still on nine boards. Yeah, that's uh, plenty. Uh, the guys who are on the boards representing our collective interests are terrific people, so I don't think we lose a beat. On Charter, for instance, they've invited me to be an emeritus, so, you know, I call in, I listen to the board, I do it. Uh, I read the board material, I call sure. in. I'm an insider anyway, because right. of my ownership, so, so you know, and if, if I call Tom, he answers my phone calls, and then if he calls me, I answer his, so I don't know that technically being on the board is that important. Uh, you know, I'm still chairman of uh, Liberty Broadband, which owns the control stake. And so that's the principal asset of that company. So, so I get lots of uh, connections. But for those who there. would view it in a larger context yeah. of, well, John Malone's pulling back or he's starting to you know, think about what he wants to do with his empire. No, but I would say, David, as you get older, you have other interests, right? And so you want to spread your time. I have a lot of philanthropy interests. I have a forestry business. I have a hotel business in Ireland. I have a big thoroughbred racehorse business. Uh, these all, these all are, are personal interest things. And so, you know, you do tend to want to distribute your time. So my role, my primary role is, I would call it strategic, capital allocation, uh, and making sure we have the best possible CEOs in each one of the businesses. You know, I think I get a great, a great set of guys. So I got Greg, I've got uh, Mike Fries, I've got David Zasloff. I still got Barry Diller working to make me rich. He's right. right. He still has the voting power on Expedia, right? Doesn't he? He sure does. Okay. Well, Actually, it's complicated. It is, but, I, but, probably yes. for another interview. But right Barry, Barry, with his brilliance, is still focused on making businesses that, that we have an interest in more valuable, right? So, so it doesn't get better than that, right? right. Great, great, uh, great CEOs. Uh, and, you know, businesses are challenged and sometimes they do great, sometimes the world doesn't love them. Uh, you know, it's life. It's life. So you, you just got to uh, uh, trust the people uh, that, are, that are on the front line and making these decisions and if they ask you for your advice. But you're a cheerleader, I mean, to a degree, an asset allocator. Um, and. Uh, you know, and the breadth, the breadth of the portfolio, I think, is very helpful to me because I get to see these things from a number of different sides, frequently on both sides of one issue, you know, because right. I'm on both sides of a lot of deals and I find myself conflicted a lot because of that. And so a lot of those times I have to just back away. Or if you, like Formula One's a great example, okay? okay? I had two of my companies both wanted it really badly, right? And I just had to say, guys, you know, I can't, I'm not Solomon, I can't divide the baby, go figure out, you know. Yep. And in the end, uh, Greg came up with a better solution for the acquisition right. than, uh, than, than Mike and David. So, 
you know, but it's a great asset. And it's it in the family. We're, yeah. we're going to be talking to uh, Chase yeah. Carey later. Yeah. John, we are. Uh, we have to wrap it up. You got to get in there and, and speak to all these people who've been streaming into the meeting. Yeah. Um, speaking of time, though, I always appreciate your taking a very bit of your time well, with me every year. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And thanks, Dave, for not getting me into politics. No, no, we'll yeah. keep that for another day. Oh, my God. All right. Yeah. John Malone.